Well, friends, this is my final sermon in our series on the resurrection. And, and like most all series, I find I have a lot more to study with you. But it, it's time to wrap this up. I want to touch on a few final themes related to what, what really is the penultimate question, and that's what does a resurrection mean to you? And I want to start with it with uh, almost a side point, but a common misconception. Um, and it was less illustrated to me perfectly in a Facebook post I saw the other day. Um, I'm in a group of people from my own high school in Los Angeles, Eagle Rock, and somebody mentioned the death of another student from about the time that I attended, and this is what he wrote, and I'm going to edit the names a little bit here. He says, I just heard that alumni X, Eagle Rock High School jazz band bassist, has passed away this week. Dave was one of many remarkable musicians that came out of Eagle Rock. He went on to become a sought-after bass player. He married the band director's daughter. He passed away earlier this year. And then this final line, I know that he is up in heaven now playing music for the angels along with his wife. Now, how many times have you heard somebody say something like this? Someone dies, and it is immediately assumed that not only are they in heaven, but what they are doing there is hanging out with all their departed family members and doing what they love to do on earth. Now, I get that sometimes this is simply a function of saying something polite and comforting, but I do think that it demonstrates an underlying belief that a lot of people have, that after death, anyone who is even slightly moral, uh, had something other than an awful life, will be ushered into heaven, where they will have a family reunion with, with God hanging around somewhere in the background, um, if at all. Now, I think there is reason to believe that for those who are elect to eternal life by God's grace, they will be able to interact with friends and family members uh, who are also redeemed by Christ in, in the life, eternal life that God promises. But I think that that's not going to be the focus of why we're there. And, and frankly, I th uh, perhaps not even the way that we imagine. Jesus mentions themes of eternal life and resurrection in many of his teachings and parables. But one of the story is very direct and very interesting. Sadducees come to Jesus with a question they think will stump him. Now, remember, the Sadducees are the officials that ran the temple worship. They did not believe in a resurrection or life after death, uh, which was actually a point of debate between them and the Pharisees. The apostles will use that to their advantage uh, in the book of Acts. So in their question to Jesus, they posit that a woman marries a man and then her husband dies. Now Jewish law allows that she could or should marry then one of the man's brothers to keep his family name alive, which she does. They then imagine that this happens five more times so that she would have been married at one point to all seven brothers. And then they ask Jesus, after all of them, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife shall she be? For they all had her. Think they got him stumped, right? Well, Jesus answers them. Uh, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now, Jesus tells us very little specific here, I have to say. But I think it's clear that one of the things he says is that the focus on earthly relationships that we have here is not going to be the same in heaven. It's not just going to be a family reunion. You know, we have a, a Bible study group right now studying a book that recounts all the descriptions of heaven in Scripture. Now, I have to tell you, I think that in every instance, all the biblical images of heaven are humans trying to describe the indescribable, and they're using symbolic language. In fact, many of the images don't match up, even within a single book like Revelation. So I, I don't think even the, the, the sum total of what we read in the Bible is really going to be the full picture of what we're going to experience. But in every vision, God is the center of attention and activity. Eternal life is about us being overwhelmed with the presence of God, unfiltered by the distance and disconnect 
of our life in this world. Uh, the scripture tells us that it will be wonderful beyond our imaginings. So I want to encourage you, don't be sad that it's not just a family reunion. Be happy that it's something that's going to be infinitely better and something that we can hope that we will be able to share with those who we love who have also been called by God. Um, a friend of mine used to call this sloppy agape. Um, heaven's more about God, not so much about us. It's been said that we will have three surprises in heaven. Um, the first surprise was to be to see that many people we expected to be in heaven are not there. The second surprise is to see that there are people we never expected to be in heaven. But the greatest surprise is to see that we're there. And I think that's very true. So, so let's move on. I want to say two final things that we learn as we study the resurrection. What Christ's resurrection means for our present and what it means for our future. Um, we studied Ephesians last year, one of the most profound teaching letters of Paul. And, and also it points the hardest to understand. Paul's claim was that as Christians, we actually have already experienced our own resurrection. Even here, even now. You may remember it from Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, he echoes it first in chapter 1, but 2 is the specific teaching. And this is our main scripture for the day. Ephesians 2, beginning of verse 4. But God being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loves us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And then, a little parenthesis here, just to remind you, by grace you've been saved. He can't, he can't you know, Ephesians, he beats that over and over and over through the letter. Uh, by your sins, it's, and then verse 6, which is the one that's both amazing and a little hard to get your arms around. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It is past tense, not future tense. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your doing, it is a gift of God, not the results of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And frankly, he says, you know, kind of the same thing again in Colossians. You know, people have said that Ephesians is a little Romans and Colossians is a little Ephesians. If then you have been raised with Christ, past tense, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. What a great little line there, isn't it? Paul says we've already been raised. Resurrection from our spiritual death. And we now live with God. Our resurrection isn't simply something we look forward to. It's something we experience now. And that's profound. I'm here to quote to you. In Ephesians 2, Paul claims not only that we can be resurrected bodily at the end of time, that we have already been resurrected spiritually the moment we believe in Christ as our risen Savior and Lord. In fact, Paul adds that we have already spiritually ascended into heaven. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him at the heavenly realms with Christ Jesus. The statement shows how profound the changes are when anyone becomes a Christian. It is not a matter of turning over a new life and working harder at living a good life. It's not just membership in a new religious society. Rather, it's being taken from one realm into another realm. It is being united to him in the Holy Spirit and that the powers of the age to come, such that by the new birth, by our regeneration, we are joined to the Lord Jesus. We become sharers and participators in his life and then the blessings that come from him. Specifically, Christians have been made alive spiritually, though they were dead. We were dead to God, but now the Spirit makes us able to hear truth about God. The spiritual resurrection comes when we believe that Christ died and rose for our salvation. On the basis of that objective truth, a principle of future heaven and life is put into us, and that affects us subjectively. We begin to experience foretastes of our future, final future state, a freedom to change and be like Christ, a sense of God's reality, glory, and love in our hearts and a new loving solidarity with brothers and sisters in Christ. Spiritual resurrection means that we are, in a sense, living in heaven while still on earth. 
living in the future while still being in the present. Because we are with Christ in the heavenly realms, we are already enjoying something of the life of heaven even now. The Apostle Paul talks about partaking of the first fruit. He talks about having a foretaste. The great harvest has not come, but the first fruits are available. The glimpses of glory. We should have occasional glimpses of glory. We should occasionally have heard something of the music. We should have some sensation of the life that will be lived there. So the personal resurrection that we hope for and await for has already in part taken place. Eternal life with God begins when the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sins and the need of God's grace and redemption in Christ, not when we die. It's now. And frankly, you might remember that Jesus says this very directly. John 5, 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Not will get eternal life, has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. I quote that loosely when we do communion. So it is our great hope, our great hope is not simply a future resurrection on the day of judgment, but in a very powerful way that we have already been spiritually resurrected. And, and honestly, I love this picture, that we have our lives hidden with Christ in God. Isn't that wonderful? That's hope for today. That's hope that God will continue to change us and protect us by his grace. But that does not mean that the resurrection is not still a hope for our future. A hope not based on sloppy sentimentality or on wishful thinking, but one based on the concrete reality of Jesus' own bodily resurrection from death and his promise that he has prepared a place for us and that we will follow him there. Paul told us that if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So we have a present reality, but a future promise. I sometimes get the awesome privilege and responsibility to talk with people as they near death. No one on death's best tells me how much money they made, how big their house was, how much time they spent in leisure and recreation or watching TV. They will often tell me about their families, but often as not, they will eventually find a way to ask me, what's next? I'm not big on deathbed conversions, not because they can't happen, for it's always God's timing when someone comes to true faith. But I will tell you it's a great comfort to me when I do this, and I know the person has at least publicly displayed their faith and at least tried to follow Jesus Christ in their own life. Only God truly knows a man's heart, but I do believe that what's in your heart shows up on the outside. And because of Jesus' resurrection and promises, I can tell them that their life is not over, but it is just beginning. Their body will become new and wonderful. Their soul will be turned towards God without sin and distortion. Their tears will be dried away by God himself, and they will see wonders we cannot imagine. And they will be with God for all eternity, giving him the praise and the glory that we were created for. And I will tell you, friends, that I could say none of this if Jesus was still in his tomb. His resurrection changed everything. Everything. I hope you've seen that as we've studied through the implications of that. Let me finish with one final closing thought. We have seen in each of Jesus' uh, resurrection's appearance his willingness to to both meet people where they are, but also to push them in the direction they need to go. There's a final element in Peter's personal conversation with Jesus on the shore of the Sea of Galilee that we didn't have time for this Sunday. We studied it, and I want to close with it today. It's really the last thing that the Gospel of John recounts um, there. Uh, first, you know, Jesus tells Peter, um, as he follows him, that things in, in his earthly life are going to be hard. And it's a reminder that the promise of grace in Christ is not a promise of earthly ease or success. John 21, verses 18 and 19, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you 
to where you do not want to go. And John says, he said this to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. Uh, we believe Peter was crucified in Rome. Crucified actually upside down. It shows a little bit of when the Gospel of John was written. It must have been written after that event. And, and, and then back to the scripture. And after saying this, he said to him again, follow me. So let me tell you, when someone tells you that following Jesus is going to make your earthly life happy and successful, ask them why this didn't work out for Peter. A spiritual resurrection gives us the access to God's mercy to endure hard times. And, and the hope uh, of our physical resurrection gives us the knowledge that the worst that the world can throw at us still can't separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. But life can still be hard. But then after Jesus tells him this, you'd think he'd be, you know, kind of overwhelmed by this. Good old competitor Peter has still not gotten over all of his personal issues. Uh, this sobering personal prediction uh, is not even something he contemplates for a while. No, he looks over and sees the Apostle John. And he says this, uh, verse 21. Peter turned and saw the disciple that Jesus loved, that's John's term for himself, following them. The one who had also leaned against his back during the, the supper and said, Lord, is it, who is it going to betray you? And Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Now, at this point, Jesus must have been just so ready to dope slap him on the back of the head. I would have. But, but he's definitely very direct. Jesus said to him, what is it, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. You may remember a few sermons ago I recounted a part of uh, C.S. Lewis's Narnia book, A Horse and His Boy. Near the end uh, of the story, the great Christ figure, Aslan, is talking with the boy Shasta, explaining to him all the ways that he's actually been protected by Aslan on his perilous journey. And Shasta then asks about another traveler who was on the journey. What, what happened to her? Why did this happen? And Aslan is very direct as well. He says, child, I am telling you your own story, not hers. I tell no one any story but their own. Same answer that Jesus gave Peter, right? God's truth never changes. What God asks, requires, and brings about in our lives is all laid out in his word. But we each still have our own story with God. We will all be resurrected, some to grace and mercy, others to remain outside of God's kingdom. But we each have our own story, and God tells us only our own. Don't assume that your story must be the same as someone else's, nor that someone else's story must be the same as yours. Your story is in God's hands, and that's the one you need to pay attention to. And I will tell you today that if today is the first time that all of this makes sense to you, that you feel the weight of your own sin and separation from God, and deep inside desire that God could forgive you to be raised with Christ, to have your heart hidden with him, let me tell you that that is the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And today is the day to say yes. And then let God tell you the rest of your story. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have a story for each of us. And, and, and while that story is defined and outlined by what you give us in your word, it's a story of wonder. It's a story that allows us to be with you now to, to literally be hidden with you in the presence of your Father. But a story that allows us to hope for the future, to know that this life is not all there is. It's just a shadow of what's to come, that we too will have our bodies resurrected at the end of time, have our sins covered by the blood you shed on the cross, and get to spend an eternity directly with you, with all of our brothers and sisters of the elect, in a place that is wonderful beyond belief. And Father, none of this would happen. We would know none of this. We would be certain of none of this if your son had not risen from the grave. And for that, we thank you. Lord, be with us as we live out the resurrection now and hope for it in the future. And pray these things in the name of our resurrected Lord, Christ Jesus. Amen. Friends, go from this place. For if you have died with Christ, 
you have been raised with him and your heart is hidden with Christ in God. Let that be a comfort for today and a hope for tomorrow. And may his blessing, his mercy, his peace, and his presence be with you now and evermore as he promises. Amen. Go in peace.